if I had an opportunity to talk with Tom, I would prefer to do it in person or over video like we're doing right now. And I think it would take several hours of conversation, I would imagine, if we worked together and found research that showed that it was problematic in some way, what would you do? This is the only way to argue with Scientologists. Uh, it's what you need to do with when arguing with a Scientologist or anyone from an extreme cult or extreme, somebody who holds extreme beliefs. Anthony Magnabosco has civil conversations with people to uncover the reasoning behind their deeply held beliefs. Anthony, as you know, I do a lot of interviews with extremely religious people, cult members, and in particular, Scientology-related people. So let's start with that. Imagine I'm a Scientologist. I, be, I believe I am ridding the world of the reaction active mind like where would you start where do you start thinking i'm going to have this this conversation mm. well i think it generally helps to start with curiosity <laughs> like what exactly are you talking about and what do you mean by the words that you're using that's probably a good first step is 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 approach it from a curiosity mindset as opposed to uh, a cynical mindset we tend to see a lot of cynicism these days especially when it comes to religions and that type of thing and that type of response, if, if I were to approach it very cynically or maybe even laugh or ridicule like what you're saying, it could probably result in you being becoming a little bit more defensive about your views. So being open minded, even if I don't think that is true or like I'm really skeptical about it, being genuinely curious is a really good first step, I think. Hmm. I suppose you would be curious because Scientology is a pretty mad. Have, have you done any Scientology ones yet on your channel? Oh, no, I, I've really wanted to talk to some Scientologists. And in fact, like around 2020, I got on a Zoom call. There was like a local Scientology group. And maybe there were like six of us and three of them, I think, were, were actually from Scientology. And I've been getting letters from them. I, I even have some of them over here. I, I've stopped opening them. You can see that they sent me some mail. That's from the Church of Scientology in Austin. But uh, wow, I haven't talked to many Scientologists, but my... My guess would be the reasoning and the just uh, the the value that the beliefs give them and all the other stuff is probably very similar to any type of religious group that that, that I would speak to. But again, I, I mean, I, I would try to approach it from a point of curiosity, like what, what's different about it? Why do you think it's true? Uh, those types of things. But no, I I, I would love to talk to some Scientologists. Yeah, I think you'll get some on soon. And I, I can actually set you up with one in particular, K Katie Lohman. She talks, she's good at, she likes to talk. And I did a, a whole thing with her, but I'm not good at what, what you call street epistemology. So I just had this mad conversation that was just completely ridiculous. And oh, she was really? talking about Tom Cruise visited her in a dream to recruit her into Scientology. Because when you get to a certain level of Scientology, which very few people in the world get to, but Tom Cruise did, which is operating Thetan level eight, you become a sort of deity and you can go into people's dreams and get them. So he's one of the few people in the world who they believe can do that. That's interesting. Yeah, when we're doing street epistemology, which is essentially a way of helping people critically reflect on the quality of their reasoning, that's the definition that we're, that we're using these days. We're not so much interested in the the what of the belief or the, the claim itself we're interested in the supporting justifications and how the person determined that those are reliable high quality justifications for being so sure that all that stuff is true so we tend to go deeper so i would absolutely lo love to have a talk with anyone including that person about street epistemology but my my goal would be trying to get to the foundation what's propping it up how did you decide that you have good reasons for thinking that this is true. And that type of framing tends to distance people away from the, the sensitivity of the claim itself and all the value that they get from it. And it goes to a lower level where we're exploring the, their reasoning process. And that shift tends to help people become a little bit more objective, a little bit more critical in their exploration of, of the formation of the belief. I just got a tweet from somebody who, who appears to be in Scientology who called me a bigot and said something that Tom Cruise says as well quite often, which is, uh, you know, the, the Scientology is open. You should come and have a look. Have a, if you want to know, you should, you're, you're being a bigot and you should come and have a look at the, the books and all of these things. But the truth is that Scientology, like many cults, um, it, it hides a lot of 
it, the information from its own people. Um, so it, it seems to be something stronger, something different. I don't know what it is that's holding them to this um, idea. Like, I know more about Scientology than that person in Scientology does. Mm. Is that something that you come across often when you're talking to people from various different beliefs? Yeah, yeah. Many people that you talk to who have a belief in, in a higher power or that they think that their religion is true or on any other topic that you wish to explore because street epistemology is versatile in that way, people are generally overconfident in in how they determine that it's true. Did you ever hear of something that's called the, what is it, the illusion of explanatory depth? No. Okay, it, it's this concept where it, it's essentially thinking that you know more about a topic than you actually do. So if, if I, I were to ask you how toilets work, you might say, well, yeah, of course I know how a toilet works or I know how email works. <laughs> but when you start s explaining the steps, you suddenly realize how little you know. And that's pretty yeah. much what happens even on deeply held beliefs that we're, that we're, uh, that we tie our identity to. So like a Scientologist, they're all in, in many cases, they really think that it's true. So yeah, that's very, that's very, com uh, very, very common that people are, are just highly overconfident. And you said something at the start too, that caught my attention. Like they want to bring you in and show you like, read this book or, you know, take this thing. They're basically offloading their justification onto something else. They, okay. So what tends to happen is people will give you reasons for their belief that they think you'll find convincing. They're not necessarily the reasons why they found the claim convincing. So if somebody's saying, Hey, just read this book. I, how many times people have said like, read Lee Strobel's book, a case for Christ, or in the case of Scientology, go to the, go to the church and t watch this video or something like that. That's not necessarily the reason that they found compelling or convincing. So it might be really tempting to go read the book or go watch the video and then argue the problems that you've found with those things, those resources, but it's not necessarily going to land with them because that might not be the reason that they found convincing. So you have to be really careful when we're exploring somebody's reasoning, if they offload it onto something else or, or ask you to do something, ask them if that was the reason that they found convincing. You really want to try to stay within their model as you're exploring their reasoning. That's really interesting, actually, because I think about it and I don't think that reading about Scientology did get people into Scientology because if you read about it online, you actually get to find out more than what they let you know. And it's all about like an evil galactic overlord and stuff like that. And I, I don't think that's been convincing at all. And then you've got these cults like Nixium. Nixium was basically a ripoff of Scientology, except they didn't bother with the whole story about aliens and things like that, which did make me think exactly what you're saying, that it's not actually the folklore. The fact that Nixium worked and was able to bring people in without this stuff about aliens shows that it's not that. What it seems to have been is the love bombing, the various cult dynamics, the status, the promise of status and secret information that you're going to get when you get inside. And then when they are there, it's like you say, it's like the toilet. Like, I don't know how the toy, like, I don't actually know how it works. They don't know how Scientology works. They don't know how Nixium works. And all they can say to you is like, hey, I've got faith and just uh, please read this, go and read this book. It's all there for you. And what they're hoping is, or, or maybe they're not hoping, but what the cult is hoping is that you will go in and then all the love bombing will start again and you'll get hooked in and, and need to feel special in the same way that, that they did. We tend to find that the justifications that people give for thinking this stuff is true is... Uh, Many people will say evidence, they have good reasons, it's tested, this type of thing. But usually at the heart of these beliefs, especially the beliefs that are tied to people's identity, are psychosocial. I get a good feeling from thinking that I'm going to see my loved ones again. I, I get a good feeling from thinking that I'm going to live for a billion years or get my own planet or whatever, whatever the lore says. Um, but people won't start with that usually. People aren't usually that honest with themselves. It usually takes a little bit of rapport building and being upfront with what you are attempting to do when you're exploring their beliefs. Like, I really want to get to the foundation of why you think this. Can we explore it together? Make it in, making it a collaboration and building trust. And that's usually, as you start walking through their reasoning with them, that's when they start to realize what's really propping it up. But just saying, listen, you're just basing this all on emotion and you just like the good feelings that you get. Well, you may be wrong. That might not be the reason. Maybe they do have evidence. But even if that was the case, you just blurting it out and pointing it out to them isn't likely going to be helpful. They sort of need to, and I'm in the same boat. If I have a belief and I'm very emotionally tied to it, like 
I'm really tied to the concept of street epistemology. If somebody said it's bullshit, it doesn't work. I'm going to get defensive, right? But if you walk me through my reasoning and I come to realize on my own that, yeah, maybe I'm a little bit overconfident in the effectiveness of street epistemology. That's what we're looking for, that type of, of reflectful thinking. And that, that seems to be what's needed for, for change, for shifts in confidence in the truth of our conclusions. And I think we, we sorely need that today. We have, a, we have an overconfidence problem in our culture. Absolutely right. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna show in a minute some videos of Scientology things that I sent you before. But I want to stick with what you've just said because I find that really fascinating. I, I guess you're talking in a sense about confirmation bias and the idea that uh, we are first going with like the the end goal, which is I want to f I want to believe that aliens or I want to believe that my philosophy in street epistemology works, and then sort of working backwards to make it make sense. Well, if you're asking what the process is, are you asking the process of street epistemology? Yeah, I think so. I, well, no, the process of what makes us believe things. And so, so I want ah. to believe in the aliens or the afterlife, and then we're going back and, and trying to find logic that fits it. Beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I have a hypothesis. Uh, th this isn't factually based or anything, but it's based on conversations I've had and, di and also long-form discussions with people who are into neuroscience and that type of thing, psychology. My sense is that we, we, we're navigating life, we encounter a stimuli, right? We hear a claim and it resonates with us in some way. And I'm not talking like frequencies and crystals and that type of thing, but like, um, we, we entertain it briefly. Like we, we consider it. And then because of all of our experiences to that point, we make a determination of whether or not we're going to believe it or not. But we also, we don't just say, I'm going to believe it or not. We assign a, a degree of confidence in the truth of it. But I think that this is, this is all happening subconsciously. So I might hear something, I like the concept of it, and I give it a high degree of confidence. Boom. Or I hear something, and it, it, it's disgusting to me. I give it a low confidence. And we navigate life, and we're putting our beliefs in these buckets, and we're assigning some metadata, essentially, of confidence that pairs with the belief itself. Then, when you're asked kindly, hopefully, to explore why you think that that claim is true. What I think is happening is our brain is then instantly scanning for justifications that seem correct to ourselves, right? Like, I don't want to give a bad answer. I want to give a good, solid answer. So whether it's, whether my response for why I think that claim is true has been well thought out and researched and I really studied it and I've got good evidence, uh, I, I think that's a minority in many cases. I think what we're probably doing is we're we're looking for things that we think we will find con convincing and maybe our conversation partner will find convincing. And that's what we go with. But we don't just take that that response in street epistemology and say, ah, okay, that's your reason. Let's start exploring the quality of that reasoning. We do something unique in street epistemology. We double check. This is something we call it the real reason check. They like say like, First, like, what's your claim and how sure are you that it's true on a scale from zero to 100? So now we're instantly thinking in terms of, of gradient instead of a binary true false. And now once we have a reason for why they're at a 90 out of 100, for example, we can ask them if we discover together that that's not a good reason for being at a 90% confidence, what would happen to your 90% confidence? And if they say, well, it would stay the same because I have all these other reasons then that's an indication that that's probably not a, an important reason for why they think the belief is true. And we rinse, recycle, repeat until we find a reason that does impact that confidence. And that's what we want to focus on. And it's not always about moving people down, right? They may say, I'm at a, I'm at a 90 because I have reason X. And you can explore reason X and they may realize that it's a really good solid reason. They might even increase their confidence in it. So uh, it doesn't necessarily, we, we talk about adjustments of confidence rather than lowering a confidence because it really can go in either way. Hmm. So I, yeah, I suppose it's really just about being able to have more open dialogue to really think things through. And I mean, people have been messaging you saying, hey, I was able to have a proper conversation with my dad about Trump or, or mm -hmm. Biden or whatever it might be. And uh it's important that we, we are able to have those kinds of conversations. And speaking of which, as I was alluding to before, I was sending you some videos before. Obviously, my interest lies in Scientology and, and those kinds of cults and things. Uh, that The Tom Cruise and Matt Lauer one, did you get a chance to, to watch any of that? Yeah. Yeah, I watched it this morning. 
And I think I've even okay, seen great. it so that, online before. I, I think I've seen it before, <laughs> just so you know. Like, it, it usually pops up in my social media feeds every two or three years or something. It's a pretty famous interview. Yeah, it's pretty mad, isn't it? And just for anyone who doesn't that hasn't seen it or anything, we'll we'll we'll, we'll show it in a second. But it's uh, about psychology. Psychology is the enemy of um, psychology is the enemy of uh, Scientology. Psychology is the enemy of most cults because cults say they have the answers. Um, and so, if if a psychologist also says they have the answers, which they don't always have, by the way, um, that's that's obviously you know not going to work. They don't work together. Um, and Matt Lauer is the presenter. Who Matt Lauer got in a lot of trouble later for completely different things. Uh, people often comment saying, "Oh, Matt Lauer, you know what he did, though," as if that's got anything to do with his argument with Tom Cruise. So we don't need to talk about that. But I'm just going to show um, a clip from that now. It's very impressive to listen to you because clearly you've done the homework and, and you know the subject. And you should. And, and, and you should do that also because and, just knowing people who are on Ritalin isn't enough. You should be a little bit more responsible in knowing. I'm really not prescribing Ritalin, Tom, and I'm not. So what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts about that, Anthony? Do you think? I mean, was Matt Lauer going about it? Could he have gone about it in a different way? Was there a way for it not to be so confrontational? It's hard to say. the The dynamic of that interview was unusual to begin with because it was being recorded. There's an audience. His loved one is sitting off to the side. The stakes are extremely high. He's promoting a movie. Honestly, I don't think it was the right venue to have a, a, a an extended deep conversation about his views on psychology and Ritalin and those types of things. So, but I understand, you know, in the, how often are you going to get Tom Cruise to sit down with you? I understand. You know, sometimes you have to take your moments when you get them, but I did notice that there wasn't a lot of reflection going on. I noticed that there were some interruptions. If I'm, if I'm not mistaken, it did seem like Matt was interrupting him a few times. That's never good. It just wasn't, it wasn't the right moment for that type of discussion. So of course it's going to go off the rails, especially when it's a sensitive topic that, that is, that is tied to his identity. Apparently, I, I guess this must be a thing. This is a thing in Scientology. I guess they, they really rail against like psych, uh, psychology. Is that right? Huge thing. It's a good, and a good point you make about identity. It's amazing. I mean, you, the, the way we get, I even feel it in myself sometimes. If there are things that are related to my identity, I can't think of specific ones now, but somebody suggests that it's not true or whatever. I feel like an actual physical response. And, it, it would, it, and I say to myself in my head, okay, you're feeling this now because this is an identity related. You know, I try to really rationalize, but it doesn't change. That's awesome. Well, it does, but, it's, but it's, I still have that emotion. It's still hard to, to reason. Yeah, sure. We're always going to have the emotions. The important thing is that you're noticing them. And I think that might be one of the biggest ways that we, we can propagate the concepts of street epistemology or this, this, the concept of reflection is simply being aware of what our brain is doing and how we're emotionally reacting when we have our beliefs challenged. Just being aware that we will fight to the death, basically, to maintain beliefs that are tied to our identity and the, the problematic nature of that philosophy could could be the solution to getting ourselves out of this mess uh, because in in street epistemology we give people tools so that they can then use them with people who make claims so there's a lot of effort i guess really you have to find the right venue like we talked about with tom cruise and everything um you have to have the time you have to have the patience to explore their reasoning, but it, it might be more efficient just to simply teach people, here are the things you need to be aware of as you are going through life and you, you find challenges to the beliefs you hold. And when you encounter a new piece of information, don't be so quick to assign a high confidence value to it. Ask, ask some questions, even if it's something that you, that you like to believe um, or you're threatened by in, in the case that you mentioned. Mm, yeah it's hard it's hard though but it's I, tough. Like, I like it's the tough. idea of teaching it to people I like, yeah. I, like, I like the idea of viewers now watching and thinking okay well when did I last have an argument with my parents or whatever could I have could I have done it in a way so that I wouldn't have touched on identity related issues about them obviously politics is a big one for some reason we tie ourselves to politics don't we and it's like like that's my identity I'm Trump I'm Biden I, that's who I have to be and then if somebody insults it you know it's their identity I, I had a difficult one um well, you, yeah, you could help me with this, right? Because I, my stepmom wants to bring the, their dog to, to my wedding and I don't want the dog there because it doesn't behave and it's going to jump on people and all this stuff. But I know 
that she links the dog to her identity. Mm. So how can I go about having a very calm conversation I where I where she doesn't bring the dog? <laughs> That's odd. Well, th- essentially, a street epistemology talk generally can't start until a claim is made. So, um, I, I would ask her, yeah, like, what is your reasoning for wanting to bring the dog to the wedding? Might be a, might be a good start, but I gotta say, like using this approach with family and friends is very delicate, a lot more delicate than you might s- do with a stranger on the street. So, you might have to spend a little or build a little rapport at the start. You know, how you doing, mom? Great to see you. How's how's the puppy doing? Or you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> but be genuine. Don't yeah. be fake about it. But like you know, don't just lead with that. And then if, if you think yeah. that the situa- situation is right, you might broach the topic. Like, you know, I heard that you're bringing the dog to the wedding. You know, is there any, is there any reason why you're bringing it? Because there, you know, maybe she has anxiety and this is actually helping her physically in some way. There might be a really good reason why I wouldn't just blow it off, but try to establish what her claim is. What is she, what is she hoping to achieve by bringing the dog to the event? And you'll likely get a fact claim. I'm bringing the dog to the wedding because X, right? Um, and who knows what that would be? So I would do a real reason check. Like, are there other ways that you can, maybe it, maybe it is uh, anxiety, for example. And I'm bringing it because, you know, I, I'll be less anxious with the dog. You know, and you could explore, um, I, I might say something like, are, are there other ways that you can deal with your anxiety besides bringing the dog? Or is that a necessary component to this? And she might be willing to entertain other other topics, but um, it's mm-hmm. delicate, and it's not a typical type of thing. Like like I said, we sort of start with a claim. Do you have an idea of what kind of yeah. claim she might make about about the dog? Well, I do, but I'm also wary of going too far into it. Mm. I hope just in case she listens. But <laughs> we could, we could go back to Tom Cruise and Ridlin. Uh, his claim is, you know, Ridlin doesn't work, and you should you should get into Scientology. I suppose. What do you what do you say to him? Well, I'd, I'd ask first. I'd, I'd clarify the terms that we that we are talking about. What do you mean by Ritalin? Like the actual the drug or the th- the therapy that goes with it? What exactly are we talking about? And then I would once I would have a good idea. I'd ask for his level of confidence. How sure are you from zero to one hundred or one to seven or words? You, do you strongly agree or strongly disagree? Are you somewhere in between? And framing it from a binary. It's either true or false to it's likely true or likely false, that type of thing. There's a lot of advantages to framing it that way because uh, I, I mean, I, one of the first things that comes to mind is it gives, it, it gives people permission to move yet still maintain the belief. So it would, it would be interesting to see what number he would assign to his confidence that that's true. He might say 100%, but I don't know. Um, but once we have a confidence level, we can now ask for reasons. Well, what's your biggest reason for thinking that? And he might say, well, I have all these personal experiences with it. I tried it myself and I, it was harmful to me or something. Who knows? Maybe he knows somebody that suffered. Maybe he's done research, but that would be critical. Like, okay, well, you know, what's propping this up? I've met a few people that when asked that question, they realized that they didn't have any reasons, which is pretty amazing. Uh, for them to admit it rather than like searching their brain and coming up with reasons to, because they might, they might be embarrassed to admit it. They actually admitted that, but yeah, figure out what the main reason is. And once you have that reason, this is where we get into the epistemology part. Let's say his reason is that, I don't know what, what would be a good reason for saying that? Have you ever heard somebody, what, 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 what do you think might be a good reason for that? Mm, Tom, Tom Cruise. I don't think he really gives any. He just says he just just says it doesn't work. You haven't done the research. I know the research. Mm. I've done the research. You, Great research. You don't know. Okay, so a good question would be, if we worked together and found research that showed that it was problematic in some way, what would you do? Now they can go in a lot of different ways. They may say, well, then I would take it seriously and I'd lower my confidence. Okay, cool. Are you willing to go with me and look for that research? And where should we go? What what do you what do you think is a good res, a resource to find those to find those results? We always want to be talking yeah. broadly and meta about the belief. You know, we don't want to get too wrapped up in the nitty gritty details. We want to be like stepping back and being objective about it. Um, he may say that uh, I need to see a hundred studies that show that it is 
effective before I'll change my mind. Well, then you can explore, well, what brought you to your current level of confidence now? Did you have 100 studies that showed that it was ineffective? What you're going to start noticing is that typically people set a higher standard to lower their confidence than the standard that they need, needed to raise their confidence. It's very interesting. Yes. Once you're locked into a position, it's very hard to budge for a lot of people. I need this mountain of evidence to move me down from a 100 to a 2. But it didn't take me a mountain of evidence to go from a 2 to a 100. And now you can start exploring why that might be the case. And that's the epistemology. That's epistemology and street epistemology is how we assess the quality of our reasoning. And we do it from a very broad sort of objective and also in a collaborative way. I'm not just telling him, go do your research, you idiot. I'm working with him to see what information he would need. And if it's reasonable and if he's willing and if you have the time, you can go out there with him to find that information. But what's probably going to still happen, even if he were to find that information, and I'm, I'm not just picking on that one guy, um, we're, we're pretty good about finding other reasons for maintaining the belief. And that needs to be recognized and explored. Yeah. It, it, it would be fascinating to see you talk to Tom Cruise because whenever I've seen him do it, it's been Matt Lauer. There was another one with an Australian journalist called Peter Overton and both times Cruz lost his temper ah. and then refused basically after that to talk about Scientology. And it'd be fascinating to see that approach. My feeling is, I mean, this is a guy wrapped up very, very uh, tightly in a, 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 a an extreme cult. And he's, he's pretty much as close to being the leader without being the leader of it as possible. Uh, and he's very enthusiastic about it. So he might be your most difficult participant, I think. When you're, when you're, identity is tied to the belief it makes it very challenging when your career or y your place in a tribe is jeopardized as a result of honestly exploring the quality of your reasoning those are all impediments to honest critical reflection so you're right if i had an opportunity to talk with tom i would prefer to do it in person or over video like we're doing right now and i think it would take it would probably take several hours of conversation i would imagine to get to the i don't know maybe maybe he would be more more open-minded and willing to go right for the claims but it, it can be an uphill battle you know uh once people have these beliefs that are very core to their identity we're, we're so very good about protecting that because there's a cost I, I remember i was i watched i was at a conference and there was a, a theistic there was a theist there who was talking and he was a preacher and we were in the lobby. It was me and another person. And I remember we asked him, if, if you weren't a preacher, if you weren't getting a paycheck, do you think that you can more objectively evaluate the quality of your reasons? That's essentially what we asked him. And he paused for 30 seconds. And he said, I probably would. And it was a very honest moment <laughs> that, that maybe the fact that like I'm part of this group and it would be really painful to recognize that I couldn't be a part of it. Like there would be a cost. Uh, that was a really important moment for that person. And, and I, I hope they reflected on it. That's really interesting. Cause I've just been doing a lot of live streams recently about, um, Ashton Kutcher and Mila Kunis, who are actors, uh, Hollywood actors who are in a lot of trouble at the moment because they put out these, um, statements, in a way, to, well, they were they were character statements for the judge, for Danny Masters and their co-star, who had done awful things, including sort of drugging their drinks of some to some women, and he's now got life in prison. And it was revealed that Kutcher and <clears throat> Kutcher and Kunis gave these character statements that were just saying, "Oh, he's just the most wonderful man, and he's such a lovely this and that," and everyone's very angry at them, and I'm sort of quite angry at them as well. But I do sometimes wonder if I, if if my career and my job and now my identity wasn't revolved uh, uh, revolved around uh, criticizing and digging out cults and Scientology, might I look at them a little bit differently? Might I be, a, you know, I could still criticize what they've done because because he was just awful, masters and what he's done. But I maybe I'd be a little bit more open to the idea that well, I think when it's your friend. Maybe you do need to defend them. You know, maybe they, they're around him and he's lovely every day. And I know a lot of people would then say, yes, but, you know, he's ruined lives. And, all, and I'm not saying this is a defense to Masterson. I'm just saying maybe I would look at Kutcher and Kunas a little bit differently for defending their friends, you know, but, but, I, but I'm still quite ang angry with them.
Hmm. I did see just very briefly on TikTok the letter from Mila. Is that her name? And then, of yeah. course, I just watched maybe 20 seconds of their video. And I, I don't think he got life. I think it was like 30 years or 20 years or. It, it was, it's life. Well, they say 30 to life, which oh. a lot of people are, 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 are putting out there as the, what people are a bit confused about. Everyone is like, confused about it. But apparently, what I've got, what I'm going off of is it's life, but in 30 years, he could be up for parole. Oh, I see. Okay, so it's a minimum 30 years. Ooh. Yeah, yeah I, I can relate. I mean, Eve, I'm, I'm in my own tribes. There, there are street epistemology communities. There's, there's, the, there's the nonprofit organization that I'm part of. I'm the executive director of it. I have friends across various uh, free-thinking, atheist, agnostic communities. And when I see them do stuff that I disagree with, and many times I just ignore it because I don't want to feel awkward about calling them out on their bullshit. Now that's changing. Yeah. I'm becoming a little bit more comfortable calling people out in my own tribe at my expense, but there will be a cost. There's this concept called perihesia. I don't know if you've ever heard of it or not. Um, I'll have to no. Google it, but it's something like speaking the truth to power in the face of danger or something along those lines. It's like being brave, being courageous. And it's tough. You know, I, I don't want to lose a thousand followers on my Twitter account. You know, like there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a cost, there's a social media cost. And there might be even, we might lose donors of our organization if, if I become too outspoken on certain things. Um, so I could definitely relate. And I think they're in the same boat. They're in an actor's community. They, they probably have contacts with producers and other actors and all this other stuff. So I can, I can understand why they would want to defend their longtime friend, even though the evidence seems pretty clear that, and he's been convicted, right? He's now a convicted yeah. offender, but I can understand yeah. the psychology yeah. behind why they're doing that. Yeah. And, and I mean, that kind of speaking out, I mean, it's, it's, some people speak out and it's zero cost in their in their own tribes within my tribe even me saying a minute ago uh maybe i can understand why they did it on some level is there's going to be a cost to that and you know a relatively small one because i think the viewers here like that i could you know we can be nuanced on this channel i i do wonder if they even consider the cost because they may not have even realized that those letters would have ever become public maybe they did know i, I don't, don't know. think they did yeah, no. and that might have prompted them to do the video, which probably made things worse. It probably would have been better if they just hadn't Definitely. said anything. Who knows what their motivations are? I mean, there might be there might be more to the story that we haven't heard about, and uh, it doesn't make sense to us now. But from their perspective, it made perfect sense to do it. They had a bit of a Streisand um, effect that that uh, concept where, where, when Streisand uh, didn't want anyone to look at her house. And mm. so she, I think she sued the papers or something and then everyone saw her house. Uh, similarly, Kutcher and Kuna's, I don't think that many people had, I mean, people who knew about Scientology or had all seen that their, their statements, but I don't think that many people had. And once they did that sort of hostage video with the apology video, everyone knew about it and so it looked really, really bad. Are Ashton and Mila also Scientologists? Well, this is the thing. Then they are officially not. Uh, Ashton Kutcher has made a statement years ago that he would like to find out more about it. But when you look at particularly Ashton Kutcher's statement, I'm going to see if I can find it. Um, there are a lot of words in there that are definitely at, at least influenced by Scientology. Mm. Um, so, it, for example, he talks about Danny and he calls him. This is something I've picked up on because I've never heard anyone say this. He describes him as an intentional human being. Have you ever called someone an intentional human being? Never. It's, I've never heard anyone use those three words. Even Scientologists wouldn't typically use those words, although I did look on their website and being intentional is quite important for them. The, the idea is everything you do in Scientology is with in, intent. You have to, you know, that's the main thing with Scientology. Uh, they talk about this thing, you pulled it in. If you, it, it means that anything that happens in your life happens to you is your fault. So the idea of intent is huge in Scientology. There are a few red flags in that statement that either suggests that Ashton has sympathies with or is part of or has dabbled in Scientology or that Scientology wrote those letters for them 
uh, gave them, you know, to Danny Masterson, who then gave them to Ashton Kutcher. Either is possible. It's I know that sounds oh, a bit wow. conspiratorial, but I don't know where you get intentional human being from if you're not somehow if it's not somehow related to Scientology. And you saw that word in the letters that were submitted to the court on behalf of his character. Yeah. Okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the next sentence is, you know, so he's an he's an honest and intentional human being over a 25-year relationship. I don't ever recall him lying to me. He's taught me about being direct and confronting issues in life and relationships head on. This is all quite Scientological. And I just feel like if I was trying to show that my friend hadn't done an awful thing to women, being direct and confronting things and being intentional, I don't know what that has to do with it. Mm. Yeah. Hard to say. So it might be conspiratorial. I don't know these things. It might just be that Ashton sat down and these are the words that came out of his mouth. But to me, I think there's some Scientology involvement. Hmm. Uh, well, if that's the case, then yeah, maybe that could amp up the, I mean, that might explain why they're doing what they're doing. If, if they're, if I don't want to elaborate, I mean, who the hell knows? I, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I know. Hey, you sent me another, when I sent you that uh, Matt Lauer link, you sent me a video of a recruiter, which I think a few people might have seen. It got quite big because there was a guy who was sort of holding the phone up to video record a recruiter for Scientology. I think it was in the Hollywood Boulevard or something like that. Um, and we'll show that, we'll show a clip from that now. He's trying to recruit. So what they do is, they get tried, they hand out these things and they say, do you want a personality test, right? And then they take them inside the building and they get their name and number an address and then from there they send them mail every day and phone calls every day trying to recruit them they want to get you in that e-meter that e-meter is two-thirds of a lie detector test they hook you up and they ask questions and if you're lying about things they'll know so they ask all types of personal questions so they get them get all their personal information they use it against them they say oh you want to leave i'm going to tell your mother what you really think about it i'm going to tell your cousin okay so what's going on in that video well, there's a gentleman on the street yelling essentially at a at a someone from Scientology who's busking and trying to get people to I don't know watch a movie or or take a test or something like that, like basically get on their mailing list and maybe recruit them. It seemed to me that the guy recording had experience with Scientology. It's not clear how long he was in. Maybe he just yeah. w was in there for thirty minutes and walked out, and that was enough for him. Or maybe he watched one of your videos or Chris Shelton's or. Who knows what his motivation was, but he's definitely motivated. In fact, I think I even messaged or I made a comment on one of his videos like because he's motivated. He wants to help. And in a way, he is helping. He's not helping the guy necessarily with with the materials who's busking for street uh, for, for Scientology. He's likely helping the people who are walking by and like, hey, there's something possibly shady going on here, even if there's not. Um, he's framing it as that. So that's going to remember how we were talking, like the, you, the first thing you encounter, you're assessing it and you're putting a confidence. He's lowering people's confidence in the truth of what that guy's saying, whether, whether it's true or not, whether, whether his views are true or not, the guy with the camera. So he is making a difference. He's also uploading it so that people who might find themselves walking down the street in West Hollywood and seeing that very person or somebody else doing the same thing, whether it's for Scientology or some other thing, uh, they might be a little bit more cautious. So there is a value in what he's doing. The problem is that people could watch those videos of him ridiculing the guy because he's wearing a very tight vest and he's, you know, he's, he's, you look like a Disney character and all this other stuff. He's being, being very rude to him. Yeah. People could observe that and think that that's the approach that I need to use when I encounter my cousin who's into Scientology. And that's a that's a that's an unfortunate outcome of those types of those types of examples that we see online. I think a lot of people mimic them. They 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 find it funny and they want to be funny. They want to be humorous. They and they'll often model and mimic that behavior. And that's that's not going to be helpful in helping that person reflect on why he's out there busking for this religion. So. <clears throat> Now it might, you know, that, that guy might be watching the videos and looking at the comments and being like, damn, that guy just crushed me. Um, that happened in one of my videos. I, I had a talk with a, with a young guy on campus. He was a Christian and I posted the video and I ran into him later. He's like, man, you destroyed me in that conversation. But it, it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, hostile, the conversation that we had. 
it was only after the fact where he he watched his own self in it and he realized how faulty his arguments were um the sad thing about that clip though i have to say is that he didn't that guy holding the materials didn't really get a chance to talk at all the guy with the camera didn't give the busker any opportunity to explain his point of view and that would that, that was a comment that i left for him is like Try look, you know, if you're really this motivated to talk to these people, look into street epistemology if you're trying to help the person who's out there busking. Now, again, it might not be the right venue. He's immediately outside of the Scientology building, I, I think. If, if that guy with the materials were to stop for five or ten minutes and have a good, long, drawn-out discussion, I don't know. Jehovah's Witnesses will send another person over to interrupt that kind of exchange. I don't know if Scientology would do something similar. Uh, but that is the way to, yeah. to really help people reflect on their own reasoning is a one-on-one -on -one exchange where you're really being cordial and you're asking questions. Yeah, it, it it definitely didn't feel like that was helping. I think even, even I found, you know, I don't, I've got this whole channel that's anti-Scientology, and even I was watching it going, oh, come on, this is not going to help, because the guy is just... I mean, if we talked about identity before, he attacked everything ad hominem, as you as you refer to, about his tight shirt and stuff. And he's probably proud of that tight shirt, because <clears throat> he's obviously worked out, and he's got the quite muscular physique, but it did look a bit ridiculous. But he's just going to feel very defensive and emotional probably and is not he's just well, where's he going to turn then well he'll turn back to scientology where everybody's telling him how wonderful he is uh, although right. you know they they won't all tell him how wonderful as he gets further and further into it and the abuse all starts but by that point he's too far in and it's worth noting that i that i think a lot of these religions count on that type of resistance or they're very good at reacting to it and turning it into a positive see see how how fallen the world is this is why what we have is true you know that it's, religions are so good at reacting to force they're not very good at reacting to hmm <laughs> let's explore that together can we that's mm -hmm. that's what they're threatened by so the more examples we have of civil conversations where we're helping people reflect on the quality of their reasoning and watching them really ponder the truth of what they think is true, that's gold. That's that's gold. Here I am on the gold show talking about gold. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's where it's at. And that is the biggest yeah. threat to these religions is is people being able to set aside their egos and set aside needing to get a million views on a freaking TikTok video and having a genuine conversation where you're helping people walk through their own reasoning and then evaluating it to their own standard and then leaving them alone to think about it and see like, well, what do you want to do with that information? That's what we're doing with that's street why, epistemology. That's why your channel is so brilliant actually, because YouTube does not reward nuance. And it's something that I've found frustrating over the years. And it does incentivize you to pick a side and to go down hard on it. So I love that you, you do what you do. <clears throat> and I love that uh, you pick out what these people, and it's not always religions on your channel. There's all sorts of different uh, ways that you try and understand why someone's arrived at a decision. But in those cults and religions, um, it is interesting to see, because I was watching one where you were talking to people from the LDS, the Mormons, uh, how there's a point where they seem to be suggesting that it's more virtuous to believe something without testing. Um, basically, I mean, you go back to Adam and Eve, uh, the very first thing that we're taught in the Abrahamic religions is um, listen to God, don't go to the tree of knowledge. So from the very beginning, knowledge is not what you should have. And yep. it does make a virtue out of not asking too many questions. We, we see this with Scientology. You don't, you're not even allowed until you've paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to actually see uh, any of the doctrines, by, by which point you're so far in, and then you have to believe in Lord Zenu. Uh, and all that kind of stuff but yep. but take me through that that was a great uh, interview if you know which one i mean mm -hmm. uh, when you were talking on a university campus with two boys they were sweet they were sweet kids yeah. uh from the lds that's a problem again on my channel we often see the extremes we talk about the flds and warren jeffs and the horrible things done to uh people you know with huge families and all these things but these were just quite sweet kids weren't they they were yeah i was on the campus this was maybe three years ago and I was out there doing my street epistemology stuff. I stand in a, in a courtyard. I haven't done it since 2020 because I've been really involved with the nonprofit that we've been working on. 
Street Epistemology International. But yeah, I was out there with my cameras, and I didn't even know that there were LDS missionaries on that campus. But I, I saw them, you know, I saw them a mile away, essentially. Like, oh my gosh, there's Mormons coming. And that's great. Like, Mormon Mormon material is really good for, for social media and like there, there's an advantage to that, but I also wanted to talk with them because you know, there's these young guys and as they were approaching me, you can see them stopping students and handing out their literature. They were doing the same thing that the, that the busker in front of the Scientology build, building was doing, but they were going around telling them all about the great book of Mormon and all this stuff. And they approached me and we, we had a brief exchange about whether or not they should do the interview. One was a little hesitant and another, another one was very eager that talking with two people simultaneously also presents a challenge because there's two different claims. There's two different definitions of words. There's two different confidence levels. There's two different justifications. Like, uh, it's, it's much more challenging, but yeah, we had a really good talk and I think it came down to, um, one was told that it was true and the other one, uh, tested it. Like, uh, I think in the book of Mormon, they say you can actually test this out to see if it's true by call, you pray to the Holy spirit and then you see fruits in your life. I might be butchering that a little bit. And it's the presentation of these fruits in your life after you pray that is confirmation that the book is true. So that's what we explored throughout that conversation. And I ended up recently chopping that up and putting it on TikTok, And that one got a lot of views. Um, so there, you can get a lot of views on these, on these clips. Um, but my conversations are usually 20 or 30 minutes long. And a lot of people don't have time for those types of things. So, so we've been chopping them up and, and getting a lot of, a lot of interest in that. But yeah, it was a good conversation. I, I don't know if you wanted to get in specifically about what they said, um, or anything at all like that, but. Well, I would say about the, the views. I wonder that, I mean, that stuff when you go out with a microphone and talk to people, that, that's just automatically, if I'm flicking through stuff, I'm already there. You know, mm. I don't know what that is, but, we, you know, uh, but there are people who do it and it's not street epistemology. I know you do it and Peter Boghossian does it. Of course, he was on this show some time ago, but then there are people who just go and make fools of people and they get even more views. Yes. So that's the problem. That's what's, that's so discouraging about what we're doing is that we, we have a very hard time. We have a very hard time breaking through the noise and the salacious clickbaity titles and the thumbnails will bring people to the videos. And if you, you know, you show a very contentious moment at the start, right before the whole video plays, that's good. And you don't tend to get yeah. that. Like the highlight of a street epistemology discussion. If, if we are on the street talking to a stranger with your microphone or you're, you're talking to a family or, or colleague or whatever is when they take a moment and they're like, you know, Hmm, <laughs> when they're reflective, yeah. not when they're combative. And that doesn't tend to sell very well unless you're burnt out on the combative stuff. Like I think a lot of people don't even know that there's an alternative to the combative stuff because there's such an overwhelming amount of it online and breaking through that has been an ex extraordinary challenge for us. Yeah, for me, for me, in my own YouTube endeavor, it's been about everything in moderation. I understand that there is, uh, and I think a lot, I'm sure you do as well, we understand that there is a, a marketing aspect. We understand that if you hold something back in the title, that might seem a bit tabloid or, you know, rather than say, I heard my father kill my mother, you say, I heard my father do this to my mother. And it's just mm. basic human psychology of intrigue because they feel satisfied. You're, you're already satiated if you've read that title and it's told you everything that's happened in it. If, if there's like a bit of a you, oh I wonder what that is so you start with that and you do end up going down a bit of a rabbit hole and you do go a bit further and then suddenly it's a little bit more sensationalist than you wanted it to be but then you've got this thing of like well I'm putting hours and hours of my life into this I do want people to actually watch it so and Peter Boghossian I mean he has had these really big moments in particular I don't know if it's something about him or there were a lot of moments where students have come down and started to argue with him even though he's staying very calm and I think that's created uh, some of those big viral moments. Yeah, they've been big viral moments, um, which is good for street epistemology, I suppose, in general. But yeah, if it gives uh, an, a, a wrong impression of what the approach is, then that's also problematic because now we have people coming into street epistemology communities looking for tools to battle people. 
you know, and, and be confrontational with them. Not that Peter was necessarily doing that on that video. I think he was being pretty. Like he did a really good job of staying calm. calm. He stayed freaking calm, and that I mean, I've I've been in some pretty tense situations myself when I'm surrounded by people, and I could feel my nerves going. So uh, he did a really good job yeah. of staying calm. Yeah, I feel my nerves going watching that particular episode. Um, I guess I'll put a link to that as well at the bottom of or whatever. Like, uh, oh boy. but it's just it's just that that tribal thing kicks in, and you're just watching these students who I'm feeling at that point know relatively little about real life. I start to sound like an old man now. You know, <laughs> they don't students don't know, and and this guy is a professor. And he's not even coming down on one side or the other. He's just saying, like, let's talk about these both sides. And they're just going crazy at him. Well, so. if I remember right, they had a sign. And the, it, it, I don't think it was a question. It was a statement. Oh, was it right? there were two genders prove, me, prove I'm wrong? Was it something like that? I, I think it was like, I don't, I don't even know. So I, I've, it's been a long time since I watched the video and I didn't watch the whole thing. Okay. But um, <clears throat> how the conversation starts is important and also the venue we talked about the venue before with Tom Cruise that is not an appropriate venue for a reflective conversation now it was good for getting people out of the buildings and getting down to like talk about you know like get enraged about it and work them up but what it, what would have been ideal is if all the people that were that, that were in Pete's entourage there paired off with one person from from the group who was willing to talk with them and if they had one-on-one -on -one conversations that were still recorded I bet they would have been amazing. But when, you, when you're talking to this person, now I'm talking to this person, now this person who's up in the thing yelling down at me, <laughs> it, it, it's not, not going to likely be very helpful in helping people take another look at their reasoning. So you just have to be aware of that stuff. And Yeah, I mean, videos like that are, 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 are somewhat good, but they might be more damaging to to street epistemology than than we might expect because like people you know people might think that that's what I need to do I need to go out and I need to I need to instigate in order to have the conversations you don't need to do that people want to talk about these things uh, what we tip, tend to do I, like I'll when I was going on doing it I would just go out there with my GoPro on my chest and just like flag people hey do you have a few minutes to talk about any claim that you wish to talk about that's on your mind that you think is true and you act out on it because you think it's true. Yeah. I want to tell you all about my God, or I want to tell you all about karma or people want to talk about these things. So a sit down conversation is way better than, than a, a melee, which is what was happening there. I think with uh, when I'm watching, well that, but also even just watching your channel, which is a much calmer, uh, you're talking to these back to those two Mormons again, um, I started to wonder about g the idea of giving ground, which is what at one, one or two times during that conversation, it looked like they might be about to give ground and suggest, hey, maybe, you know, and it is wrapped up in their identity. Of course it is being a Mormon. Is Do you get the feeling that it is li almost physically painful for them? And And have you given any thought to the biological evolutionary usefulness to that? As in, why, does, why, would it, why is it good that it hurts for us to not be stubborn? Oh, wow. That's interesting. There, probably are, <laughs> uh, there must be some evolutionary advantages to it. I mean, you want to stay in the tribe that's protecting you from all the wild creatures that are out there, right? So, um, And uh, there's probably group intelligence happening. You're probably better off in a group of 10 people than a group of two. If you're navigating through the forest, maybe. I don't know. Um, who the heck knows? But... When I was engaging with those students, I was paying very close attention to how they were responding to the questions that I was asking. I don't know if that's evident or not, but I'm constantly watching body language and I'm listening to the words that they use or the amount of time that it took for them to formulate their question. Or when, when person A, when Mormon uh, missionary A said something, what was Mormon missionary B doing? Did he just cross his arms when Mormon A said something? So it, you, you do this enough, you start really noticing how people are reacting physically and, and by the words that they're saying so that you can notice it. It's really important to notice that they're emotionally reacting to something or they, they said or did something that was odd. That's usually like an indicator. Ooh, I need to go there. There's something there. So I, mm. I would recommend paying attention to those cues. 
How, how much stock do you place in body language? Because it's a really not, contentious not theme that in much. itself, isn't it? Not that much. Mm. Not that much. Okay. Just but sudden big things I, compared I, to I, the face. I think there's something to it. Like I, there was one I, just recently, uh, three weeks ago, um, my friend Reed Nicewonder, who's the president of Street Epistemology International, he was passing through town and we set up some chairs and we did sit down with beautiful cameras and um, it was like lawn chairs and it was more comfortable for, for me to kind of cross my arm and sort of rest them on my, my belly a little bit. And I, and I knew I was like, I'm signaling closed mindedness here by my body language, but it was the most comfortable thing for me to do. And interestingly, the person I was talking to started mentioning body language and that type of thing. And I thought for sure she was going to mention my crossed arms, which could have led to a really cool discussion. But no, I don't, I don't put a lot of stock into it, but there are indicators that are worth pursuing. That's all that that is like, Hmm, why do they just yeah. do that with their hand? Why do they touch their neck when you ask them that question? Did they have a sore throat or did you hit a nerve? Like, are they reassuring themselves? Are they, are they, are they becoming defensive or they're, 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 they're feeling vulnerable here? Hmm. There's just so much else, isn't there? Like I'm often aware, I, I'm looking at you and I can see myself next to me and I'm often aware that my t-shirt is not as, like it's not ironed and it's a bit wrinkly. <laughs> Uh, but if I drop my arms like like that, it looks okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but if I'm, I'm like, like if I'm like like forward, when I lean forward, this back of my shirt comes up, and I hate it. So like, I, there you you go. Know, but I'd, I'd rather be leaning. I really want to be leaning forward because I'm like I'm interested in what you're saying. Um, but I know that this looks better, you know. And I could also like my chin. <laughs> yeah. I, I get a double chin if I put my head down too much. But if I raise it, it's nicer. <laughs> so like I'm constant. You know, we do these things subconsciously, and then we're sending mixed signals. So that it's it. I wouldn't put a lot of stock in body language. Language, uh, language itself is interesting, isn't it? I, I did a, I'm a linguist myself. I speak five languages, and I'm, I'm fascinated by, you know, uh, the, I've seen that detectives will say that they notice that if somebody uses their own pronouns quite often, it, I mean, it's quite obvious when you think about it, but it just means that they are taking more responsibility. They're owning it a little bit, whereas they're on, on more uncertain ground when you notice they don't really say I very much or we, and it's like uh, they, they, those are the kinds of things they, they tend to pick up on. Hmm. Yeah, I've never noticed that myself. I'll have to pay attention to that. I go. will have to there pay attention go. to that. Uh, yeah, <laughs> one will have to pay. Um, where can we? Where shall people go and find your stuff, Anthony? Head to streetepistemology.com for just general information about the technique that that we're trying to promote because I think it's what we need in today's world. And then, if you're interested in me specifically, just go to Twitter, and then I have a link tree link there, and you can find all my other social media. Okay, we'll stick your YouTube channel below as well in a link. People should check that stuff out. Great, great. Thanks for having me on, Andrew. Yeah. Really appreciate it. You're very welcome. People, go and check out Anthony's channel and all the other things he just said. There'll be links down below. Keep watching this channel. There's some similar things above my head that you should keep watching.